We meet here uh, at a time of great uncertainty in America. We meet here at a defining moment. The era of greed and irresponsibility on Wall Street and in Washington has led us to the most serious financial crisis that we faced since the Great Depression. You know, they said they wanted to let the market run free, but what they did instead was let it run wild. And in doing so, they've trampled on our core values of, of fairness and of balance and our responsibilities to one another. Everywhere you look, as Joe mentioned, the economic news is troubling. But for so many Americans, this is not news at all. 600,000 workers have lost their jobs since January. Home values are falling all across the country. Record foreclosures. Your paycheck doesn't go as far as it used to. It's never been harder to save. It's never been harder to retire, to buy groceries or to buy gasoline. If you put it on a credit card, well, they've probably raised your rates. In so many cities and towns across America, it feels as if that precious dream, the dream that so many generations fought for, is slowly slipping away. And there are a lot of young people here tonight, but I want everybody to understand that, that we all stand on the shoulders of previous generations. Those who fought for our independence, those who fought in the Civil War to make for a more perfect union. Those, like my grandparents, who struggled through a Great Depression. Those who marched for civil rights and women's rights and workers' rights. Those who helped to shape our industrial society so it had worker safety laws and so it had basic regulations and people wouldn't lose their life savings. A lot of work has been put into creating a system in which everybody has a shot. We don't begrudge those who are wealthy. We want people to succeed. But we also want to make sure that everybody can succeed. We want to make sure that nobody is left behind. We want to make sure that America is still a land where I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper. And that's what this election is about. Last night we had a debate. And on issue after issue, from taxes to health care to the war in Iraq, you heard John McCain make the case for more of the same policies that got us into this mess. But just as important as what we heard from John McCain was what we didn't hear. We talked about the economy for 40 minutes and not once did Senator McCain talk about the struggles that middle class families are facing every day right here in Virginia and around the country? He defended his plan to give $300 billion in tax cuts to corporations and the wealthiest Americans. But he had nothing to say about the fact that wages have flatlined and jobs have been shipped overseas. He railed against some study of bears in Montana. He's really hung up on those bears. But he had nothing to say. All right, it, it's just trickling down a little bit here. That's OK. I, I'm going to have to get my dry cleaning going, too. But John McCain, he had nothing to say. Now, Joe, you look good, though. So if you want to cut out, that's all right. Joe's one of the best dressed vice presidents that we'll ever have as well. But he had, John McCain had nothing to say about the fact that more and more Americans can't afford to pay for college, can't afford health care for their families, can't afford a retirement that's dignified and secure. Senator McCain spoke again and again about the need to keep spending $10 billion a month in Iraq, said nothing about the need to end this war so that we can invest in good jobs and rebuild our roads and bridges and lay broadband lines throughout rural communities all across Virginia to help rebuild America. The truth is, 
through 90 minutes of debating. John McCain had a lot to say about me, but he had nothing to say about you. He didn't say the words middle class, not once. He didn't say working people, not once. You see, I think Senator McCain just doesn't get it. He doesn't get that this crisis hit Main Street a long time ago. That's why his first response to the greatest fiscal meltdown in a generation was to say that the fundamentals of the economy are strong. That's why he's been shifting positions these last two weeks, looking for a photo op trying to figure out what to say, trying to figure out what to do. Well, Virginia, I know what to do. You know what to do. Joe Biden knows what to do. We need to stop giving those tax breaks to corporations and CEOs on Wall Street and start giving them to families on Main Street. We need to turn the page on the failed policies of the last eight years and finally put working people first. And you know what, Fredericksburg? That's why I'm running for president of the United States of America. touch, on your own, do nothing, got nothing to offer leadership in Washington. We need a president who will change this economy so it finally works for your family. We need a president who knows that America's strength and leadership abroad depends on the strength of our economy here at home. I'm going to take off my jacket here. It's going to work. We need a president who will fight for the middle class every single day. And that's exactly what I'll do as president of the United States. You want a hat? I don't need a hat. I'm going to give Joe Biden the hat. I know these are difficult days, but here's what I also know. I know we can steer ourselves out of this crisis. That's who we are. That's what we've always done as Americans. A band of patriots gathering together to fight against the tyranny of an empire. Those who fought and struggled against slavery. Those who struggled to make sure that everybody had the right to vote. We fought, we struggled before. Our nation has faced difficult times. We've stood out in the midst of storms and bad weather. But at each of those moments, we've risen to meet the challenge because we've never forgotten that fundamental truth that here in America, our destiny is not written for us, it's written by us. Now, there are many to blame for causing the crisis we're in, and it starts with those speculators on Wall Street who game the system and the regulators in Washington who look the other way. But now that we're here, every American, Democrat and Republican, CEO and factory worker, has a stake in solving this crisis. We're going to have to save our financial system. If we don't act and act soon, your jobs, your life savings, your economic security will be put at risk. This administration started off by asking for a blank check. I said, sorry, we're not going to do that. We can't expect the American people to hand this administration or any administration a $700 billion check with no conditions, no oversight, when a lack of oversight in Washington and on Wall Street is what got us into this mess in the first place. 
if the American people are being asked to pay for the solution to this crisis, you've got the right to make sure that your tax dollars are protected. That's why I've laid out a few conditions for Washington. First, we need to set up an independent board selected by Democrats and Republicans to provide oversight and accountability for how and where this money is spent every step of the way. Second, if taxpayers are financing the solution, you should be treated like investors. That means that Wall Street and Washington should give you every penny of taxpayer money back when this economy recovers. Third, we cannot and will not simply bail out Wall Street without helping the millions of innocent homeowners who are struggling to stay in their homes. They deserve a plan, too. Fourth, Washington needs to feel the same sense of urgency in passing an economic stimulus plan for working families, a plan that would help folks cope with rising food and gas prices, help them prepare for a long winter, save one million jobs by rebuilding our schools and our roads, help states and cities avoid budget cuts and tax increases that would fall hardest on those with the least. And finally, this, is, this one's important, the American people should not be spending one dime to reward the same Wall Street CEOs whose greed and irresponsibility got us into this mess. There's been talk that some CEOs may refuse to cooperate with this plan if they have to give up their multi-million dollar salaries. I can't imagine a position more selfish and greedy at a time of national crisis. So I have a message with them. Don't even think about cashing in. I will not allow this plan to become a welfare program for Wall Street executives. No way, no how. Now, I'm glad that Senator McCain's embraced some of these principles. A little late, but I'm glad he came on board. But, but as Joe said, you got to remember, you can't undo 26 years of a record of deregulation and voting with the fat cats and suddenly try to undo that in 26 days. It doesn't work. You can't have a crisis conversion. The John McCain you've heard over the last few days is an awful lot different from the John McCain who's been in Washington for the last 26 years. He talks about getting tough on Wall Street now, but he's been against the common sense rules and regulations that could have stopped this mess for decades. He says he'll take on the corporate lobbyists, but he puts seven of the biggest lobbyists in Washington in charge of his campaign. You know, he, he, he's been talking lately about the old boys network. You know, but what you have, if you want to take a look at it, that's what John McCain should call his staff meetings. If you think those lobbyists are working day and night to elect my opponent just to put themselves out of business, then I've got a bridge to sell you up in Alaska. You know, the truth is, my opponent first reacted to this crisis by saying what he believed, that the fundamentals of our economy are strong. He didn't just make a mistake. He revealed an out-of-touch philosophy, one that he has followed for decades. The idea that if we give more and more to those with the most, prosperity is going to trickle down like this, this, this gentle shower here, like mana from heaven. The idea that no harm will be done if we let lobbyists shred consumer protections and fight against every regulation. Well, what we've seen over the last few weeks is nothing less than the final verdict on this failed philosophy. And I am running for President of the United States because the dreams of the American people are too important to have eight more years, four more years, one more year of this nonsense. It is time for change in America. Enough is enough. Joe 
Biden and I have a different way of measuring the fundamentals of our economy. We know that the fundamentals that we use to measure economic strength or whether we're living up to that fundamental promise that has made this country great, that America is a place where you can make it if you try, that everyone should have a chance to live their dreams. That's why it's not called Joe's dream or Barack's dream or Jim's dream or Sally's dream. It's called the American dream because we want everybody to appreciate it, everybody to have a chance. I wouldn't be standing here without that promise. That's the promise we have to keep once more. When I see young veterans come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, I see my grandfather, who fought in World War II, marched in Patton's army. But when he came back, a grateful nation said, here, here's the money to go to college on the GI Bill. In the face of that young student who's sleeping just three hours a night because she's going to school all day and then working the night shift to take care of an ill sister, I think about my mom who had to raised me and my sister while working and going to school at the same time. Had a couple of times go on food stamps to make sure we had enough to eat, but was still able to send us to the best schools in the country. When I listened to another worker tell me that his factory shut down, I remember all those men and women on the south side of Chicago who I stood by and fought for two decades ago after the local steel plant had closed. You know, those are my heroes. Theirs are the stories that inspire me, that shape me. It is on their behalf, on your behalf, that I intend to win this election and keep the American promise alive. Unlike Senator McCain, it didn't take a crisis on Wall Street for me to understand that folks are hurting. Two years ago, I introduced legislation to stop mortgage transactions that promoted fraud or risk or abuse. One year ago, I called on our Treasury Secretary, our Fed Chairman, to bring every stakeholder together and find a solution to the subprime mortgage meltdown before it got worse and infected the entire economy. In March, when John McCain was saying, I'm always for less regulation, he didn't mention that last night at the debate. That was back in March. That was just a few months ago. He forgot, apparently that he was always for less regulation. I called for a new 21st century regulatory framework to restore accountability, transparency, and trust in our financial markets. I believe that our free market has been the engine of America's great economic promise. It's a market that's created a prosperity that is the envy of the world, rewarded innovators and risk takers who made America a beacon of science and technology and discovery. But the American economy has worked in part because we've guided the market's invisible hand with a higher principle that America prospers when all Americans can prosper. That's the change we need right now. That's the kind of change I'll bring to Washington. That's the kind of change that Joe Biden believes in. John McCain thinks that he can just grab one of our signs and say, I'm for change too. He doesn't, have, he doesn't understand. Change, is, change is, is not about slogans. It's not about TV commercials. Change is about what's in your gut and what's in your heart and who's you're fighting for. Change means a tax code that doesn't reward the lobbyists who wrote it, but the American workers and small businesses who deserve it. I'll stop giving tax breaks to corporations that ship jobs overseas. I'll start giving them to companies that create good jobs right here in the United States. I'll eliminate capital gains taxes for small businesses and startups. That's how we'll grow our economy, create the high-wage, high-tech jobs of tomorrow. I will cut taxes, cut taxes for 95% of all working families. McCain doesn't want you to know this. He keeps on spouting those untruths about our tax plan. But under my plan, tax rates will actually be less than they were under Ronald Reagan. If you make less than a quarter million dollars a year, you will not see your taxes increase one single dime. In fact, I offer three times the tax relief for middle class families as Senator McCain does. 
Because in an economy like this, we, the last thing we should do is raise taxes on the middle class. I will finally keep the promise of affordable, accessible health care for every single American. If you've got health care, my plan will lower your premiums. If you don't, you'll be able to get the same kind of coverage members of Congress give themselves. And I'll stop insurance companies from discriminating against those who are sick and need care the most. Insurance companies have to do right by their customers. That's the kind of change we need. We'll create the jobs of the future by transforming our energy economy. We'll tap our natural gas reserves. We'll invest in clean coal technology. We'll find new ways to harness nuclear power in a safe, environmentally sound way. I'll help our auto companies retool so that the fuel-efficient cars of tomorrow aren't built in Japan and South Korea, but they're built right here in the United States of America. I'll make it easier for you to afford buying those new cars, and we will invest $15 billion a year for over the next decade in affordable, renewable sources of energy, wind power, solar power, the next generation of biofuels, an investment that will lead to new industries, 5 million new jobs, and save our planet from global warming. That is something that we can do. That's the change we need. And Fredericksburg, now's the time to finally meet our moral obligations to provide every child a world-class education. You, you know it. That's why you're here. Because you understand it will take nothing less to compete in the global economy. So I'll recruit an army of new teachers. I'll pay them higher salaries. I'll give them more support. We'll invest in early childhood education to close the achievement gap. We'll create higher standards and more accountability, but we won't ask teachers to be teaching to the test every single day. And we will keep our promise to every young American, if you commit to serving your community or your country, if you work in a homeless shelter, if you join the Peace Corps, serve in your military, if you invest yourself in something larger than yourself, if you invest in America, then we will invest in you. We will make sure that every young person in America can afford to go to college without taking out fifty, seventy thousand dollars worth of debt. That's a commitment I make to you. is the kind of change we need. Bottom-up growth, innovation, that will advance the American economy by advancing the dreams of everybody. Now, I understand times are hard. This won't be easy. Now, the storm hasn't quite passed yet. Sometimes the skies look cloudy, and it's dark. And you think the rains will never pass. But here's what I understand, that as long as all of us are together, as long as we are all committed, then there's nothing we can't do. That's why we started off this campaign saying, yes, we can. That's why we understood that black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, young, old, rich, poor, it doesn't matter, we're all Americans. That our destiny will be shaped by us and this young generation that's out here, the young people of America, understand that the clouds, these two will pass, that a brighter day will come.
that if you are willing to work for us, if you're willing to roll up your sleeves, if you're willing to lock arms and march and talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, make a phone call, do some organizing, yes, do some community organizing, then I promise you, Fredericksburg, we will win Virginia. We will win this general election. And you and I together, we will change the country and change the world. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.